Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of the uh, Coin Brief podcast. Um, I'm Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Faggart. And um, we are your correspondents uh, for this podcast. We talk about the latest news in the industry, latest developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. And uh, so uh, here we are for our fourth episode of the podcast. And uh, some interesting stuff been happening this week. Um, uh, first of all, the, the U.S. Marshal, um, they announced last week, of course, that they're going to sell the Silk Road Bitcoins. Uh, about almost 30,000 Bitcoins, and they're going to divide them up into 10 different blocks for bidders. And they invited interested parties to, um, to contact them and ask for more information um, about the auction. And the people who did email them asking for more info, uh, the U.S. Marshal's Office replied to that email, uh, CC'd all of the recipients instead of BCC'd. Uh, the oldest mistake in the book when it comes to email. And now, uh, you know, we know about 40 different names of potential bidders in the Silk Road Bitcoins auction. So, uh, like, a lot of a lot of people are, like, speculating um, about whether these people would actually bid on the coins, what they would do with the Silk Road Bitcoins if they won the auction, uh, people like Barry Silbert are on the list. Um, Bill, Barry Silbert is the CEO of Second Market, which is um, trying to build like a big institutional investors marketplace for Bitcoin. But I, in my opinion, the most interesting part of this story is just the fact that the U.S. Marshal's office, it, we now know the potential of their stupidity when it comes to technology. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I mean, well, I'm really looking forward now to to what other mistakes they make uh, when it comes to this auction. I mean, you know, you know how I feel about government. They can't do anything right. They mess absolutely everything up that they touch. But I mean, I kind of feel for whoever accidentally hit the reply all because. I mean, everybody has a story where they've accidentally sent an email out to everyone that they only meant for one person. Yeah. So, I mean, I can kind of understand where he's coming from, but still, like, this is a really huge deal. It's close to 30,000 Bitcoins. That's like $18 million worth of Bitcoins. You could be at least somewhat cautious. And who knows? It could just be, you know... Like, a classic human error or it could be another example of government not doing anything right at all ever yeah I, I mean i think it's both of those like the reason that government is so bad at doing all this stuff that you know they promise the people that they're gonna do this awesome stuff and then when it actually gets down to the to the bureaucratic mess of implementing policies and in the u.s marshall's case you know trying to deal with selling digital currency uh, that they originally confiscated from an online black market. Like, yeah, it's 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 human error. These people don't, they aren't that good with technology. Um, <laughs> they've already messed up with email. <laughs> they don't what? even know how to send an email. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and, I can't believe, um, it's surprising what, even to me. You, um, the only picture of it, the only screen cap of it I saw had the names blacked out. So what are what are some of the biggest names that were on there? You mentioned the CEO of Second Market. What are some of the other names? Yeah, yeah. So um, I didn't recognize most of them, actually. Uh, there was a lot of people who, like, did some independent research to find out, like, who these people are, you know, digging into their history and stuff. But some of the names that I recognized was, um, okay, yeah, Barry Silbert from Second Market. Another guy from Second Market. Um, uh, his, his name is Michael, um, Michael Menno, Michael Mono or something like that. Uh, he's, he also works at second Mark. He's an ex executive. Um, and also, uh, the deputy director of public affairs from Yelp, uh, was also on the list, but <laughs> originally, uh, Coindesk published the article with the whole list of names. And then apparently this guy from Yelp contacted them and asked them to take, to take Yelp's uh, Yelp's um, company name off there because right. it makes it gives people the impression that Yelp themselves might be one of the bitcoins, and then oh, everyone's speculating 
is Yelp going to implement Bitcoins into their service yeah. somehow? But no, with this guy from Yelp, like he was just uh, asking about the auction for his personal um, personal use for the Bitcoins, possibly. And that seems to be the case with most of the people on there. Um, there was actually a guy, so just some random guy, um, he posted on the Bitcoin subreddit that his name was actually on the list. But, uh, you know, he said that he doesn't even have the money to uh, cover the $200,000 deposit for the auction. He couldn't even, like, uh, uh, raise the money to do that. So he's like, you know, I'm just, I, I just emailed them for information about the auction with no actual intentions or ability to bid for the Bitcoins. And, you know, it's a big possibility that most of the people on that list were just asking for information. But it is, it is pretty interesting, I will say that. Right. Yeah, I mean, regardless of their intentions, if they're actually planning on uh, making a bid or not, uh, this mistake by the U.S. Marshals, they've, it's made all of these people targets. For yeah, hackers. yeah, yeah. Because, you know, they, yeah, most of them uh, might not be uh, even realistically considering bidding on it, but um, they've now, it's now been made publicly aware that they at least have an interest in Bitcoin. Yep. And uh, they may be holding some already, and so they're just a target for hackers who are looking to uh, get into unsecured wallets. Yep, and that's what that guy uh, who posted on the, on the subreddit, he was talking about, like, now this whole thing has just made me a target for people. People think that I'm rich, and now yeah. they're coming after me just because I inquired about this auction. So, okay, I've got the list right here. Let me, let me read some more uh, people from this list. <laughs> you, you know, we're just delving too deep into their into their privacy but oh well <laughs> it's um, already out there yeah it's already out there for everyone to look at and let me just say again disclaimer um none of these people are necessarily planning to bid on the bitcoins none of them even necessarily have the resources to bid on the bitcoins but these are the people who have expressed interest so we've got Daniel Falkenstein, he's an assistant professor at Rowan University, a Barry Silbert I mentioned. Luther Lowe, pr director of public policy for Yelp. Um, Malcolm Oluzwanmanmi, chairperson of Little Phoenix Investment Group. I, I butchered that name pretty well. And um, Fred Arisam, co-founder of Coinbase. That's pretty interesting. Um... Uh, William Brindice, head investment manager at Digital BTC, so that's a Bitcoin-related company, and then uh, a few other people who don't aren't necessarily in the Bitcoin industry already, but work in um, the investment industry uh, and and venture firms and stuff like that. Then there's one guy. Uh, his name is Shem Booth Spain. He's just an artist and musician. So, I mean, there's all kinds of random names on this list. Uh, there's yeah. there's 40 of them total that were leaked. And, you know, viewers, if you're curious, you can go look for it yourself to find the whole list. But, you know, this is this is one of the most entertaining stories that has come out, in my opinion, um, from from the Bitcoin ecosystem lately. Uh, I'm... I'm psyched. I'm psyched to see what else the U.S. Marshal's office uh, messes it's, up. It is so ridiculous, man. Like, I I can't believe somebody could be that that careless with eighteen million dollars. <laughs> yeah, it just baffles me. So, I mean, what are what are? Let's talk about some of the possible ways that they can mess up um, the actual sale of the eighteen million dollars worth of bitcoins. <laughs> they could send it to the wrong wallet. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, somebody could hack them. Yeah. Uh, I why are people trying to do that already? I I wouldn't be surprised if they're already trying to hack them. I I definitely wouldn't be surprised either. When this whole thing started last week, we talked about this last week. Uh, when somebody noticed the transaction on uh block on blockchain dot info. Yeah. 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 People, people were already saying they were like, "Ha ha ha!" I bet it's not even the government. I bet somebody hacked their dumbasses and yeah. and they're transferring the bitcoins to their own wallet. Uh, I mean, it's a possibility. 
Definitely, definitely. I mean, like, what would you there... have to do to hack it? Like, I, I know you can you no can idea. brute force you can brute force the private key if you have the right software. If you're good at hacking, and if your computer is powerful enough, you can just try and brute force their private key. Yeah, you can. Um, I mean, I'm not. I don't know anything about like about hacking or like you know. I'm I'm not a techie. Yeah. But um, you can uh. You can somehow get like a middleman program or virus or whatever uh, on on the computer, and if you uh, like, when you do a transaction in Bitcoin, it sends the Bitcoin to a third party address, and they essentially steal it. Huh. Um, but I don't think that could be possible in this scenario because um, unless unless the person who the winning bidder unless they have that type of uh that type of uh virus on their computer uh-huh. and it gets stolen when the government sends it to them oh but, uh, i see so I so the virus has to be on the receiving address so the attacker you know, it could be it could be on the sender too but i don't see i don't really see that happening with the uh, federal government because you know they they have i mean i'm just assuming but they're the government they have to have like like really great cybersecurity. So, yeah. And they're yeah. not ma- and they're not like buying things with Bitcoin. They made they've made like two or three transactions so far. Like they seized them all, yeah. put them all in one wallet, mm-hmm. then they changed their wallets for whatever reason last week, and then um they're going to be sending them to the the wallets of the winning bidders in 10 days. So okay. there's not really much opportunity for a hacker to you know hack the federal government and install this kind of bot or whatever it is uh-huh. to steal the bitcoin. So okay. I think for that method to be used, it would have to be the the receiver would have to be compromised. So I don't know how likely that actually is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the main thing that that we might see is them making an error on their own part again, because clearly that's uh, that's a pretty big possibility. <laughs> So yeah. I'm hoping that I win the lottery and they actually send to my address. <laughs> Maybe I should just spam like a bunch of my own Bitcoin addresses to the U.S. Marshal's office yeah, I'll, and hope I'll they do it by advice. accident. I'll, I'll make like 50 new addresses and email them mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or they could just like whatever kind of – they could just like spill their coffee on the computer – and not have the wallet backed up. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! <laughs> and dest- destroy thirty thousand bitcoins. <laughs> so, so, if that if that happened, um, I think that would be bullish news right there, because uh, then those coins are out of circulation forever. Yeah, and they're not going to be dumped right on the market. There's no chance. And yeah, um, yeah. deflation, but more deflation. I actually, I think this, um, I think this accidental disclosure of the list. Could gives us some interesting insight on what could possibly happen to the price because of this auction. Mm-hmm. Because um, of the names that you listed off just a second ago, most of them were either executives at Bitcoin companies or executives at investment firms. Yes. So, and we know uh, this: the transactions between the federal government and the winning bidders. It's not happening through exchanges. It's going to be off the market. So the Bitcoins aren't going to flood the exchanges, so it won't depress the price that way. Yeah. But So it depends on what the winning bidders do once they get the Bitcoins. Yes. Um, and since a lot of these people are, uh, like, are executive members of uh, really big uh, Bitcoin companies and also executives of investment firms, it seems like... Um, they might be trying to get all of the bitcoins at one time, so it could be possible that all thirty thousand end up in the possession of one person. Yes. So it depends on what they do with it. Um, if they hold it and use it as an investment, uh, you know, waiting for it to go to the moon, it's not. It's obviously not going to make the price go down. It yeah. could. Uh, it could keep the price flat for the last couple of days. It's been uh, at like. Between like 600 and 608 right now, it's at 590. Mm-hmm. So it can stay in that range until something happens to change that, or it can make it go up a little bit, yeah. um, uh, just because just out of excitement. Um, 
but to me at least it seems really unlikely that whoever uh, buys these coins are just gonna like dump them and spend them all on something outrageous yeah yeah that seems unlikely because why would like why would someone who just wants the cash why would they spend the cash in the first place to buy the coins yeah. just to dump them? Even if they're going to make some profit, like it seems like too much of a hassle for most yeah, people. Yeah, because the people who are actually going to be bidding on it, they've already put $200,000 into it. Um, plus whatever the bidding prices end up being for these blocks of 3,000 Bitcoins. Yeah. So um, it doesn't really make sense for someone to spend all this, uh, all this money to spend bitcoins, you know, they could they could have just spent the dollars and yeah. you know, gotten the same stuff. So um, definitely, it it changes it, it slightly changes the prediction I made last week, which so far has been right, by the way. Um, I said that for sure the auction would make the price go down, uh, but now it seems more likely that the price will stay flat or even increase a little bit. Huh. So. Huh. Um, my prediction last week was that um, after after the um, the sell off stopped uh, because of the fear from ghash.io and the stuff going on in Iraq that I was hypothesizing about, um, I said that uh, the price would go back up to around six hundred and it would stay there between the five eighty and six hundred range, and it would possibly even go up a little bit until the um, auction and so um i just want to pat myself on the back because i've been right so far <laughs> yeah one week one week of success <laughs> i've got and i've got 10 more days i've uh -huh. got 10 more days and i'm gonna say that the price is either gonna stay flat or it's gonna go up a little bit huh. i don't think it's i don't think it's likely that these uh coins are gonna be dumped on the uh, market or the exchanges. You don't think um, you don't think some some exchange traders are gonna get some cold feet and think that it's gonna go down, and then that will cause them to sell in advance of the auction before it happens. Because like I agree, that the auction won't drive the price down, especially since we've got all these people who are um, probably buying just to personally hold it. Uh, they aren't gonna just dump it, but. Uh, there's probably some traders out there who think that it will get dumped, right? And they're yeah, they're thinking um, that the market's going to be a bearish market for a while. That's a definite possibility, and it shouldn't be ruled out. Um, I think that the likelihood of that fear was reduced a lot since that uh, list of names got accidentally leaked. Yeah. Um, because now we know who these people are. We know that a lot of them are from investment firms and, and yeah. major Bitcoin companies. Yeah. And uh, so they're playing with a lot of money, and um, I think that increases the likelihood that uh, traders on the market are going to expect these coins to, to be hoarded instead of immediately dumped. Mm -hmm. But now, I think anything it would have been different if we if one of the names in the list had been like Ben Bernanke, for instance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if it leaked that he want he possibly wanted to buy up thirty thousand bitcoins, like that would be pretty big news because. Then, like, you would think that, okay, Ben Bernanke is probably going to just dump them, I guess. Like, why would, why would the Federal Reserve Chairman want Bitcoins? Or some other, some other like, random just government uh, figure, like, just trying to buy them up and get rid of them or something. Um, but, yeah, these people are going to hold it. They're going to hold it. Yeah. It's going to be good. But, I mean, uh, Bernanke would just, trying to be, would just be trying to help us out, though. I mean, he, he, sees, he sees that Bitcoins are too, um, are too valuable, which is obviously a result of underconsumption. So he would just buy them up and then dump them on the market to yeah. drive prices up a little bit. Yeah. Help, help the companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's, <laughs> that's obviously not happening. There's, there's actually not that many surprising names on this list. Um, like, no, yeah, there really isn't anyone from government. It's just a bunch of, um, like, major Bitcoin companies, capital management companies. Uh, there's a lawyer... You know, I mentioned the artist and musician. Um, so yeah, you know, I, uh, one other thing that I noticed as well is um, this. This only happened a week after they announced the auction, and already, already there's forty, at least forty names who are interested in the auction, right? 
So I think that bodes well for the auction overall and, and how many bidders that there probably will be. There's going to be several different bidders on this. And it's not just going to be like, you know, a couple people like bidding against each other and then the price stays pretty low and then they get like a ridiculously good deal on coins, which um, would actually incentivize them to at least sell some, I bet, to, to make some profit. Yeah. But there's going to be a lot of bidders on this. I'm excited to see this happen. I hope that like, I hope there's a way that the media can like can cover this as it's happening and and you know, like right. see the bidding war in real time. And I'm interested to see what the bidding prices are actually going to be, because um, this is actually going to be a sealed bid, which means that um, everybody everybody gets one bid per block. I guess they can vote on every block of three thousand coins. Yeah. And um, and so there's not going to be any like uh, any like battling uh, between the bidders, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. They're they're gonna make they're gonna make uh, a one time bid, uh, submit it through email, I'm guessing, and the U.S. Marshals are gonna open it up and give the coins to the highest bidder. So this gonna incentivize the people to make um, much higher bids than they normally would. So I think. Mm. We could definitely see the bidding, uh, the bids be much higher than the market price. Really? And huh? Cause, yeah, because they want to get like a a big bulk of of coins at once. Yeah, because if these people if these people are competing for all of the bitcoins, um, they're you know they're going to be putting some pretty serious cash on the table. Yeah. And uh, and um. So if if they're willing to bid above the market price, they're obviously expecting it to go higher, you know, which further confirms the suspicions that uh, that these people are going to hold it instead of dump it as soon as they get it. Yes, yes. And the the really cool thing about Bitcoin that you know enables more possibilities in this situation is that let's say um, let's say Barry Silbert wins like half of the uh, Stilk Road Bitcoins, like five blocks or whatever. That's 15,000 Bitcoins. What's cool is he can decide after that if he wants to keep half of that stash for himself and just hoard it, hold it until we go to the moon. And then he can just take the other half and maybe, um, you know, put it put it into second market, provide more... Um, uh, more funds for the overall market or just or just do whatever with it and create a second business if he wants you know like he can move that money anywhere and like there there's no like there's no hard line between personal use and business use a lot of the times right. you're 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 if you have like that much money to play around with you're gonna put it in multiple many different places like he might who knows he might go on havelock investments and you know buy stock in a bunch of different like cryptocurrency companies with you know a few of those thousand bitcoins that he got so yeah like it's it's really interesting to see what these guys do with these coins and if 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 they don't i'm sure the us marshal service doesn't know how to use coin join or any mixing services yeah. i i seriously doubt that so we're going to be able to see these coins move from the us marshal's office to the winning bidder and then if the winning bidder doesn't mix the coins, we can still watch them from there and see what they do with it. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty excited to see what happens. It's with definitely going to be exciting. And um, I'm going to be paying attention to it. It's 10 days away, so it's coming up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. End of June, right? Is it June 27th June? or 28th? I thought it was 29th, but you know, it could actually be the 27th. Oh, okay, okay. Either way, end of June. Yeah. And uh <laughs> we'll we'll find out who who wins this epic auction of of dirty coins. Dirty coins. You know then we can see what happens from there. Hopefully it'll be good things. Do you do you think that um so this this is just the Silk Road coins that were part of user accounts um on the marketplace. The government is still holding the Dread Pirate Roberts seized coins that were taken from Ross Ulbricht's uh, hard drives. Do um, you think it's gonna they're gonna do the same thing with those and sell them in, a, in an auction after that trial? Um, most definitely if he gets convicted. Um, 
I can't wait for I'm them to mess up that one too. I'm surprised that they're even doing this auction because I mean, um, I c- I could be wrong, but um, it's they're essentially sell illegally selling stolen property because nobody's been convicted yet. Yep. And uh, yep. you know they're not they're not allowed to sell to sell seized property until the owner of that property has been convicted. Now, since these are just user accounts, maybe that doesn't apply. Um, but that's what a lot of people are saying, and so it, it seems like a pretty bold move that they're actually doing that. Yeah, it is kind of a bold move, but then again, the government is bold sometimes. They they don't yeah. give a, they don't give a damn. They don't give a damn that some accounts on Silk Road were actually selling legal products. You know, they don't give a damn that the vast majority of drugs on Silk Road were actually. Um, um, relatively harmless i mean most of the dealers were selling marijuana and it's like yeah well that's that's legal completely legal in two states now and we have medical marijuana in over a dozen states uh yeah new york new york state just legalized or they just worked out a deal to legalize medical marijuana today that was announced oh wow very nice yeah so that's another state yeah good for new york so i mean (laughs) Whatever the government has these coins now, so yeah, someone someone's gonna get them. Yeah, on Silk Road, the majority of drugs being sold was really high quality marijuana and um, prescription drugs. Yeah, like there were very few instances of meth, uh, heroin, and cocaine being sold. They also sold uh, hallucinogenics like LSD and mushrooms too. Yeah, 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 um, and uh, MDMA pills. Yeah. Yeah, like they weren't they weren't even like selling a ton of hard drugs like heroin and and coke and such like it was it was a it was a pretty good well regulated marketplace and I and like a- anyone watching this who's who's curious to find out like um, how much good Silk Road actually did in terms of reducing violence go check out my article that I wrote a couple weeks ago about this topic and. Um, yeah, it's 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 a really interesting phenomenon, and you know we've still got we still got a um, bunch of darknet markets that sprung up to replace Silk Road. Um, hopefully, none of them get uh, get raided by the FBI as well, or else we'll start we'll just see we'll just keep seeing these random yeah. like auctions pop up where the government's trying to sell these coins they stole from marketplaces. Yeah, I I actually saw I think. Um, it was a different. It was a different government, another country, but they actually raided one of the dark net dark net markets. A different country. Recent, did? Very recently. Yeah, huh. I'm looking it up right now. To see. Um. Yeah, New Zealand. Huh. Oh no! It was. They were dark net market related. But not necessarily the market itself. Right. Right. Yeah. That's so. that's been happening more in the U.S. as well. Uh, I think there was some guy in Florida who was arrested for. Uh, uh, he, like the, they've they've been arresting people who have both been selling large amounts of drugs on darknet markets, as well as people who have been buying large amounts on darknet markets. So so they're they, they're trying to take down these people who. Um, are either buying to resell on the streets or who are selling to people who resell on the streets, which is, which is one of the main reasons why it reduces violence. But, uh, like yeah. the government sees it as, Oh, these are the, these are like the kingpins we've got to take down. They can't, it's not easy for them to take down the market operators. Like, yeah. Some, I mean, it's, it's peer to peer networks. I mean, yeah, they can yeah. take down one guy and, and then, the market will still be fine. Yeah, yeah, and I think that a lot of marketplaces now are covering their tracks better than Ross Ulbricht did. If it's true yeah. that that guy like tried to hire a hitman and all this crazy business, if that's true, I don't know if it is. It could be the government trying to slander him. But if it's true, like that's a serious, serious misstep. And yeah. You just, I mean, you can't, you can't do that. So, but um, did you hear the story of uh, how Ross Ulbricht actually got busted? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I read the I read the stuff, but yeah, refresh my memory. He um, he was on his laptop in a public library. Yes. 
and uh, so yeah. it wasn't yeah. it wasn't like super RoboCop hacker technology that they that the FBI used to bust this guy. They just kind of found out that he was uh, met, that he was uh, part of it, and so they f- somehow figured out he was going to the library one day, and they followed him there, and he was on his laptop. Yeah. And he he stood up to like go to the bathroom or something, and um, and they knew that his hard drive was encrypted, so they had to they had to get him before he closed his laptop, or else there was no way they'd be able to get into it. <laughs> yeah. So he like he stood up to go to the bathroom or something, and as he was closing the lid on his laptop, the people who were there undercover pounced on him, and that's how they got it. like it was just like. It was just sheer luck, basically. Yeah, they were probably watching from the shadows for like the right moment to go, yeah. to go and tackle him, get the handcuffs on him, and then go hurry, snag his laptop before it goes to sleep or locks or something. So yeah, yeah, he didn't he didn't cover all his tracks. He messed up. Yep, but I actually saw, um, I think it was on Reddit that they were um, that his defense is like they're they're trying to use some loophole. Uh, in the law that says um, server hosters aren't legally responsible for the things that go on on their servers. And um, so I don't know. I I guess that could work if they, if they can prove that he wasn't buying and selling drugs, he was just like running uh, a deep web node or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, his lawyer will probably try and make that defense. Yeah, but and and I there's also a story that came out where he's he's trying to claim his bitcoins back, his personal stash from the government, saying that it's his property. But at the same time, he's not admitting that he ran Silk Road, but he is trying to say those are his bitcoins. So interesting, um, interesting legal argument. Uh, I can't yeah. wait for that trial as well. That's set for uh, early November, I think. Oh, this is um kind of related to that it would the um the fbi got a hacker i saw this a few weeks ago um he like he hacked into at&t servers and got a bunch of people's information and they um and so the f the fbi called him and arrested him and he was in prison for a while and um he appealed his case and so it went to the appeals court and the judge threw out the case um, because of a technicality. Uh, the guy was the guy was in somewhere in the Midwest. I think it's like Arizona or New Mexico. Hmm. Uh, and the um, and the actual AT&T servers that he hacked were in um, some state in the northeast. And so they um they prosecuted him in the state where the AT&T servers were instead of the state where he actually committed the crime. So the judge threw out the case. Hmm. And so after he got released, this guy sent an invoice to the FBI um, to uh, telling them to compensate him for the time he spent in jail. And, um, and his, he said his going, his going rate for his hacking services was one Bitcoin per hour. And so he like added up all the hours he spent in prison, and it was like tens of millions of dollars yeah. that he sent a bill to the federal government for. It was hilarious. Yeah, because he couldn't he couldn't work during that time, so he's like, "You got to compensate yeah. me. I couldn't work." Yeah, I thought that was hilarious. Like the the fact the fact that he just like sent a bill to the federal government for making him stay in prison, but he also wanted it payable or uh, paid in Bitcoin, which I thought was even <laughs> funnier. Like he he wanted like. I can't remember how many bitcoins he wanted, but it was like several million dollars that he wanted the government to pay him. That's pretty funny. He should have he should have yeah. just sent them like a straight up like a um, a bitcoin payment request, like you know in, <laughs> in text payable to my bitcoin address and then in the send them the amount. QR code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, he sent them like a legit like legal invoice. It was. Wow. Yeah. Oh, very and professional. He, he wrote, Good for him. He wrote like a, a letter and stuff too. It was pretty funny. Wow. wow. I just that I just remember that talking about Ross Ulbricht. I don't know what it has to do with Silk Road or anything. Probably nothing, but Yeah. Hey, laws laws are laws are 
funny, man. Like if you if you know the right like loopholes to exploit, you can use a lot to accomplish almost anything. It's harder when you're going against the government because they've got pretty much all the good lawyers on their side. But yeah, you know, um, if if Ross's lawyer is pretty good, if all these other guys' lawyers can uh, are creative enough, they can find a way to maybe yeah. maybe get some of their rights back. You know. Yeah, that's why lawyers make so much money, though. They're good at finding loopholes in the language and stuff. Yeah, that's true. All right, well, we will um, we'll uh, have to stay tuned for further developments in, in the Silk Road Bitcoins drama. This is my Coinbase shirt. Can't really. Nice. It's just kind of a random design on the front, but on the back, it's got Coinbase. Oh, it says Coinbase. Yeah. I got this last year at the San Jose Bitcoin Conference. 2013. Did you pay for it in Bitcoin? I got it free. Free? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Better That's than paying even better. in Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Japan announced that they wouldn't be pursuing Bitcoin regulation. Um, Interesting. Yesterday, I think it was, the Swedish Central Bank released like a report on uh, digital currencies and it was fairly positive huh. as far as central bank reports go. Um I don't know any. I don't really know anything about this, but um, but BitPay is getting like um, they're like sponsoring a college bowl game or something. Yes, for three years in a row, they're going to sponsor the uh, Saint Petersburg College Bowl, and it's going to be known as the Bitcoin Saint Petersburg Bowl. Well, that's um, pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, pretty big marketing move. That's pretty yeah. cool. Um. I don't know. Like I said, it was kind of a slow week this week. Yeah, um, I'm just I'm looking at the, some of the top stories on the Bitcoin subreddit. Uh, Tiger Direct Canada is now accepting Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, most people saw that coming though, because the Tiger Direct U.S. website has been accepting Bitcoin for a long time now, and there was actually a, a hint on the Tiger Direct Canada website that they were looking into Bitcoin. So that's not that much of a surprise. Yeah, uh, they Tiger Direct did an AMA uh, right as they announced that their Canada uh, website would be accepting Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and um, they they said that they were going to start rolling out um, Bitcoin uh, payment acceptance to their uh, brick and mortar stores as well in oh, the near future. Very nice, very nice, yeah. cool. They're very very friendly towards Bitcoin. Um. So, I mean, other other stuff like Apple. Apple is um, Bitcoin trading apps are coming back onto the App Store. Uh, they reversed their policy, what, a week and a half ago. And now all the apps that were once banned couldn't get on the App Store before. Now finally returning. So now Apple users, iPhone users actually have something they can download to help manage their Bitcoins and buy, yeah. sell. You can actually, Gift just updated their app for iOS. You can buy bit, um, gift cards on Gift directly with Bitcoins through the iOS app. So that's an interesting development for iPhone Yeah, that's users. pretty cool. Um, P2 Pool got, has 1% hashing power now. I don't know if that's significant news or not. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, it was, it, before it was less than one percent. Yeah, well, um, I think it was created in response to uh, Ghash. Yeah, and uh, it's it's like a decentralized mining pool. I don't really know how it works, but um, it it's decentralized, so the hashing power uh, can't be controlled by one person. Right. Like, um, like for instance, uh, when Ghash when it is in a period where it has 51% hashing power and somebody gets a gets control of the servers, you know, they can double spend. But since it's decentralized, you know, there are no servers like that with P2 pool. So, yeah. And it's what a lot of people on, on the Bitcoin uh, subreddit were encouraging uh, miners. They're encouraging miners to point their uh, rigs towards that because it's, um, if it can get, if it can get a significant amount of the hashing power, it's, um, a pretty substantial solution to the centralization problem. Yeah, and um, uh, this mining mining group called Petamine um, is considering join, joining P2 Pool, and they have over a thousand terahash per second of hashing power. So that's a lot. But 
Man, they're, if, they're, if they barely only reached uh, 1% of total hashing power, man, they've got a long way to go, though, to, to really be any kind of competition against ghio or any real like uh good protection against 51 percent attack they got a long way yeah i think um i think the problem is is that the the miners who are using ghash is they just um maybe they just don't like change but also i think they just trust ghash yeah yeah they've supposedly um, they have pretty good customer service they're really super reliable um, it's profitable. A lot of miners say it's the most profitable pool to be a part of. And also Ghash is, um, the other half of them or whatever is, is CEX.io, mm. which, um, is an exchange and you can actually buy and sell, um, m mining power from Ghash. You can exchange that on the CEX.io, uh, yeah. exchange. So that's what they like about it apparently. Right. But I mean, um, what we see happen when uh, when Ghash gets like when they start even getting close to fifty one percent is um, people get scared and they start selling. So, yeah. uh, you know, if if the trend continues and they keep getting more hashing power and they you know maybe they get like sixty percent hashing power and then people get really scared and the price goes down several hundred dollars, maybe then miners will start leaving because uh, because they'll understand that it's a result of Ghash becoming too powerful, uh -huh. and then maybe they'll start pointing their rigs at a P2 pool. Yeah, yeah, maybe, but like that same situation, you you have to uh, you're relying on on the miners themselves to make the right choice for the for the greater good of the Bitcoin ecosystem, and like I I sympathize with the people who worry a lot about uh, fifty one percent attack because. Even though it's not um, that likely, and it wouldn't even be that effective, like, yeah, the whole part of the appeal of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized, it's and trustless. there is no, yeah, there's no, it, it's trustless. You don't have to rely on anyone else to, 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 to be a good, um, to be a, a good actor in the economy. But if if it's centralized now, with Ghio, like it, it's it's. It's like you're buying into a currency that is run by by a centralized entity, right? And that takes away so much appeal of it, right? And that is that really is a huge problem. Um, and you know, I I respect the you know the enormity of that problem, um, but I think the reaction to it is just way over exaggerated. Mm. Uh, cause pe people are saying that oh, well now you know this is why we need government to regulate bitcoin it's a market failure it's a failure of the free market as a whole you know bitcoin's dead doomed and to die yeah. forever um what they don't realize is that at the same time they're coming up with solutions short-term solutions um granted but they're coming up with solutions and um it's and they're the free market, you know. The free market isn't confined to just the movement of money and companies and things. It's you know individuals working together to solve problems. And that's what's happening. So it's definitely not a failure free market. Yeah, yeah. And um, anyone who says it, it, this is a this is a failure, like failure is a strong word. That's a strong word to say that yeah. this whole situation is a failure. I mean, it's kind of you're kind of delusional if you think that it's actually a failure. Yeah, like I've seen people say that. Well, this is proof that the free market doesn't work because. These miners are acting in their self-interest to um, by joining this really great mining pool, but it's harming the whole uh, Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. But you know, at the same time, these people are like they like P2 pool sprung up like overnight, I think apparently, and um, they're like convincing miners to pull their hashing power out of Ghash and. Uh, and they're all acting in their own self-interest because their self-interest is to preserve Bitcoin's uh, decentralized nature, and so that's what they're doing. Um, yeah, they so, see the greater I, good, right? Yeah. So, I, and I wrote an article about this saying, you know, they're contradicting themselves because um, they're saying that these miners are acting in their self-interest and it's a failure of the free market, but at the same time, they're acting in their self-interest and solving yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's. This reaction is way over exaggerated. 
but I like I'm not trying to diminish the 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 problem of the of mining yeah. centralization because yeah, yeah. it, it is, is a huge problem. flaw. Yeah. It is a huge flaw in Bitcoin. Um, but then also there is a possibility that maybe Bitcoin is just not the greatest idea. You know, yeah, that's yeah, also yeah. not a failure of the free market. Yeah. You know, um, you know, the failure of one digital currency doesn't mean that the concept of decentralized uh, digital money is flawed as a whole. Right. It just means this one project was a bad idea. It means the mining, the mining uh, formula, the way it has evolved over five years has become a problem. And, you know, when Satoshi originally um, wrote the white paper for Bitcoin and started imagining this decentralized currency, he didn't anticipate the rise of ASICs and large yeah. mining pools full of ASICs. Like, that's that's a relatively new development. And yes, it's a problem now, but it doesn't mean the idea was itself was flawed. Just the implementation yeah. and how it's evolved over time has become a problem. And there's cryptocurrencies out there who, who uh, that solve this particular mining problem. Myriad coin um, has has what is it four or five different um, algorithms for mining, and it doesn't let it's five I think, and it doesn't let e any one of them uh, go over twenty percent of the of the whole hashing power of the Myriad coin network. So fifty one percent is impossible. And, um, you know, who knows? Maybe that'll be the new Bitcoin five years yeah, from now because like, you can't do a 51% attack on it. I think I think what people need to realize is that you know, um, there's there's a pretty uh, definite distinction between, um, between the economics behind cryptocurrency and the technical aspects of the different currencies. Yes. Um, because cryptocurrency as an idea, as an economic concept, it's, it's logically sound and um, it, f it fits pretty well within the already established uh, monetary theory. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we might – Bitcoin might fail. I mean the, f the first projects that come from a new idea usually do fail, but that doesn't yeah. mean that cryptocurrency as a whole – is a flawed um, is a flawed economic concept. And I think that's what people need to realize. Like they're looking at Bitcoin, and they're seeing this flaw in um, in the uh, proof of work uh, yeah. hashing uh, algorithm, and um, and they're saying, well, Bitcoin won't work, so this probably means that no cryptocurrency won't work, and that's the real right. problem. Yeah, yeah. All these cryptocurrencies, like. A lot of them work a lot differently than Bitcoin. A lot of them use proof of stake instead of proof of work. Some of them use a hybrid of proof of work and proof of stake, a pure coin, for example. Um, so, yeah, I, it, there's there's a ton of cryptocurrencies out there. Cryptocurrencies in general is is a fantastic inv invention. It's so it's so interesting and it opens up so many different possibilities. Um, in the economy that weren't available to people before, but we just we just need to pick one that'll have lasting yep. long-term viability that is not vulnerable to this theoretical fifty-one percent attack that is a, a flaw in the proof-of-work algorithm. Yep, I'm still I'm still confident though that. Um, the market will make it maybe not impossible. But so difficult that it's not even worth implementing a fifty-one percent attack, just because of the reaction the community uh, has every single time Ghash gets close. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a definite um, operation of the market. Uh, these you know these people they react, they come up with all these solutions, uh, short-term solutions to take power away from Ghash, um, and they're also they're also trying to get uh, they're trying to contact the Bitcoin Foundation uh, who work on uh, Bitcoin core to uh, to modify it to solve the uh, mining problem. So, yeah, yeah, I don't think we should rule Bitcoin out just yet because yeah. of this one problem, because it's definitely fixable. You know, it's not an inherent flaw. Um, it's definitely fixable. And um, I think the, like the, I think the market is proving that um, it can do a pretty good job of fixing itself. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. I mean, um, all these, all these 
uh, companies and uh, people on the board of the Bitcoin Foundation, like none of them have have that much interest in in moving this whole infrastructure that they built for Bitcoin and transferring it over to a new cryptocurrency. They're highly, highly invested invested in Bitcoin, and you know all these different companies that have sprouted up to to support Bitcoin. Um, none of them want to want to like want to transfer over and and so yeah they're gonna they're gonna look for solutions to this hopefully the marketplace does fix itself and you know that would be fantastic if ghash um self-regulates itself starts working with the bitcoin foundation uh, to to change the code and fix this but we'll have to wait and see we'll have to wait and see you know i'm definitely open to any any um cryptocurrencies that purport to solve this problem and are better than Bitcoin. I, I recently bought some Myriad coin um, about a week ago, so uh, I've, I've got some of that as well. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see yeah. what happens. I might start doing that. I might start investing in some altcoins, um, but I'm mainly going after gold and silver right now. That's what I want. Oh, really? Especially, especially if I can buy it with Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. yeah are I are think, you a gold um, bug? Yeah. Yeah. I was I was a huge gold bug before I um before I got convinced before I got sold on Bitcoin. Uh-huh. Um and I still think that gold is a better immediate hedge against a uh, government. Huh. Because um it just has historical precedence and um it's way more valuable than Bitcoin is right now. Um, I think in I think in the long term, cryptocurrency is is gonna be way better than precious metals ever were as money. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. But gold gold is nowhere near uh, rendered obsolete because of cryptocurrency. So I think the best way to go right now is to invest in Bitcoin, maybe a couple altcoins, and then gold and silver. Yeah, like what do you what do you get like gold bars or just coins or like what do you i mean i've never I i've never really met a like a, an actual gold bug before how does that i work? don't have i'm a gold bug who doesn't have any gold unfortunately oh. um <laughs> um but yeah the the best thing to do is get is get bullion which is which are the gold bars um because the coins a lot of the time they're numismatic coins they're rare coins they're commemorative coins mm. and so um their market price is based off their like um their commemorative value or their uh, sentimental value rather than the actual gold content. Yeah. So to get, to get just like pure raw value, the best way to go is to buy uh, bullion bars. Huh. And um, that's what I want to start doing. Obviously um, it's, it's $1,300 an ounce right now, so I can't buy like ounces at a time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping to start buying like, you know, like, um, like, bars that weigh like half a gram or a gram you know start yeah. out small i i always wanted um to get like a cassatius coin is that how you pronounce it cassatius coin yeah i think so um uh that's made of gold actual gold just all throughout gold and then with a bitcoin code on it with a full bitcoin loaded onto that uh code man th like if i i'm gonna get that i'm gonna get that actually <laughs> yeah I, was just I mean, either either way, you're good. If if Bitcoin's not the way to go, you still have like this giant gold coin, and if gold's yeah. not the way to go, you've got Bitcoin on it. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I, if I if I actually got that, I feel like I would just like hang it up on my wall or something, or frame it or something, and yeah. just leave it leave it there for like a couple of years, and then just see, you know, where that where the gold and Bitcoin are both worth a couple of years from now. Yeah, it's it's gonna be an interesting ride. I think it's going to happen pretty soon, like within our lifetimes. A lot of people are saying, like, a lot of people say, oh, I mean, the government might be collapsing and everything, but I mean, uh, it, it, it could be like another thousand years for the government collapses, but. Yeah, they're kind of on the their way down, but they, I wouldn't say that they're in the process of actually collapsing yet. They're trying to, they're, they're like, they're losing their influence and politicians are just trying so desperately to, to hang on to what power they still have. But I mean, um, I'm not looking at the failure of government as like a political upheaval or anything like that. I think the government's just going to go broke and they're going to go out of business, you know, just like a, just like a grocery store would, you know, they're just going to close their doors and be like, you guys are on your own. 
Yeah. And so um, the thing is, though, they're already broke, and they're still operating yeah, all these exactly. all these agencies. That, that's that's why I think it's going to happen pretty fast. Uh, and when I say pretty uh, fast, I mean like twenty or thirty years. Okay. You know, I don't, not like tomorrow, but um, like that's, just that's, a couple like couple decades down the line, yeah, they're just going to close all the agencies. Decades. Yeah, like um, I I think I think we might see if not governments collapse completely, I think there's a good chance we could see a giant, another Great Depression, like a giant economic crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people will, you know, flock to an alternative form of currency, whether it be crypto coins or precious metals. Um, I, I think that's definitely possible uh, yeah. within the next few decades. And I think there's at least some likelihood that the whole thing could fall in on itself within the next 60 years, you know, within our lifetime. Yeah, I mean, I, I, 60 years, man, like, I think, yeah, the U.S. government is, is gonna collapse by that point, but there's still gonna be, like, even if the government collapses, there's still gonna be tanks, there's still gonna be soldiers, there's still gonna be police, uh, people with, um, these weapons and, and armies that they've built up in this, in this military industrial complex, even if you don't have like the FDA anymore and, and the DEA and all these stupid agencies, like they're still going to have a big mass of weapons and tanks and stuff. So there's still going to be some like some ruler or tyrant or whoever calls themselves the president at the time is going to be controlling this stuff. And who knows what they're going to do with it. They're going to be like, well, my government is powerless over my own country. Now I might as well go attack a different country and try and um, imperialize some more. That's true, um, but that's why I think the future of money is so important. Because if if the people, if the market transitions to a currency that can't be controlled by governments, yeah, the whoever is in control of the military, you know, whatever military still pledges allegiance to that government, they they have control over them, you know. But they're only they're only good for you know one go around, and then. You know they don't have nobody accepts their money, so they can't. Mm -hmm. You know they can't re up their weapons. Mm -hmm. So you know yeah. they can try one time, and if they fail, then they're just out of luck. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess like um uh, like this massive ma military has been built up in America, uh, mainly because of people's taxes. I mean, the the government uses people's taxes to help pay for. And they print war. money. Yeah, and, and they print money, and they borrow money from China. So once they can't do that anymore, once the vast majority of the people are using alternative currencies that 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 the government either, either doesn't know about or they know about it, but they can't take your money from you in, in the form of taxes, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder to fund wars. So I guess they better be happy with um, what tanks they have now because it's going to be harder to get the funding for that in the future. Yep. The, the single the single strongest thing that links people to a government is the money is money and uh, as, as long as governments have monopoly on money they have complete control over the people so I think that if your interest is peacefully uh, is peacefully deconstructing government the most effective means uh, that you can use to achieve that end is to um, encourage people to stop using government money bingo that is that is it right there that is the answer stop using government money um i, I actually i have a shirt i have a shirt right here um i ordered it from a bitcoin related website a few months ago but it's too big for me i'm probably going to end up selling it on ebay or something or maybe like a, a bitcoin subreddit for selling items but it says uh um, government money is so 2008 <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit too big for me but um, I'm gonna sell it to a to a happy owner. Uh, nice sentiment though, and I totally believe it. Like the only way we can, or the best the best way to to stage a peaceful re peaceful re revolution is by using alternative crypto cri cryptocurrencies, and just not supporting the old broken system anymore. And yeah, that's I think that's a pretty good moral to to end this episode yeah. on, right? Yeah. Yep. Stop using government money. There you go, guys. <laughs> that's uh, that's the moral of the story for today's episode. So, um, yeah, that um, was the fourth episode of the Coin Brief podcast. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be back next week. I'm Sean Wentz. I'm Evan Faggart. And uh, we'll see you guys later. <laughs>